Um, so I'm Emily Hunter. I am the um, Nature Protection Policy Officer at the RSPB in Northern Ireland. And um, I'm also part of um, so the RSPB, along with Northern Ireland Environment Link and a number of other environmental NGOs in Northern Ireland, have set up a, a, a Brexit coalition to try and sort of address the environmental issues as a result of Brexit. So within that, I lead the Environment and Nature Protection Group, which both Vivian and James are also members of. Um, so I'm afraid I am going to talk quite narrowly about the kind of the, a sort of narrow idea of a green Brexit or what the challenges to having that would be rather than kind of more broad political position. Um, so to start off with, when it comes to the environment and sustainability, I think it's fair to say that Brexit is both an opportunity and, and a risk for those things. There is an opportunity for us to, to help to shape future policy um, in both the Northern Ireland and the UK as we go forward. Um, and possibly push for this kind of narrow idea of a, a green Brexit um, against this radical change. It's, it's quite surprising, I think, to find that Michael Gove is kind of leading the push for this, but you know, I think we, we might as well seize this opportunity and try and, and get something out of that. Um, however, I think it's also fair to say that it's, it's a risk for the environment. Um, and I'm not sure how, as you know, we said in the, the earlier presentations, I'm not sure how much we're in a position really to have the radical, that radical change that's needed. So um, I'm afraid I am more going to talk about the, the risks for the environment than, than the opportunities. Um, so first of all, there's a threat that most of our environmental legislation in, in the UK and in Northern Ireland comes from EU law. Um, so obviously, there's a possibility that we might not have that, that legislation anymore. Um, the, the UK withdrawal bill is meant to, to bring over all of, EU, the, all of the EU legislation into the UK and Northern Ireland law. Um, although they have said that they will be brought over where practical. So for environmental legislation, I think Andrea Ledson, when she was environment minister, said something about, we think that 80%, I can't remember the exact figure, but it wasn't all 100% of environmental legislation will be able to be brought over. So there is that question actually about how much they're going to bring, keep in UK law. Um, and then also as part of the withdrawal bill, because we're leaving the EU, we can't just copy and paste that EU legislation into UK law, we have to amend it to make it reflect the fact we're no longer members. And that obviously means it's all opened up, and there's a risk that standards could be watered down during that process. And just to give an example, in the um, UK government's white paper on the repeal bill, they gave an example of a sort of amendment that would have to be made. They, they talked about this regulation of um, offshore oil and gas projects, I think it's called. And they said um, that has a requirement that all, you have to do a report that has to be assessed by the commission before you can authorise a project. And they said, you know, an amendment could be that that report has to go to a UK body, which would make sense. Or alternatively, that requirement could just be abolished altogether, which I think would clearly be a watering down of those standards. So there is a risk that we end up with similar legislation, but legislation that isn't as strong as it is now. Um, so in terms of threats to the environment, both in, in Northern Ireland and in the UK, I think, first of all, there is the threat that it just won't be seen as a political priority. And, I mean, although there was this YouGov survey, I think, last year sometime, and I actually use this all the time to say, well, 80% of people said that they think environmental protection in the UK should be as strong, if not stronger. Realistically, I don't know how much of a priority that is for people, and you can kind of counter that with the fact that, I remember a while ago now, I saw a, there was a headline in the Daily Mail that was titled, The EU Cares More About Birds Than About People. And it was about an area of the, the England, southern England, where um, because of the birds directive, there was not going to be homes built or someone's garden was going to be flooded to create, recreate a wetland. Um, and I think when it comes to people's everyday lives, they, if you say, well, no, you can't build, build homes there because it's a very important habitat for, for birds, people might not necessarily think that legislation should be stronger or, or as strong or stronger after we leave the EU. And also, I mean, just the fact that so many people care about keeping the incandescent light bulb, I think, again, illustrates that perhaps it's not as much of a priority for people as we think it's going to be. And then if you add to that the fact that the economy probably is going to suffer as a result of Brexit, and in Northern Ireland, you know, everyone's saying that we'll probably suffer more than the rest of the UK. So there's going to be this big push for short-term economic goals, and that's not necessarily going to help the argument for kind of long-term sustainability and environmental protection. <coughs> and in addition, a lot, as I said before, there's the risk that a lot of the standards and protections that we have at the moment will be watered down. So at the moment we have protections for habitats and species. The um, uh, Habitats Directive and the Birds Directive are seen as sort of keystone legislation for EU environmental protection, but they keep being given as examples of things that we might not necessarily need to keep or could water down after we leave the EU. 
or even things like standards for air quality or water quality. The UK hasn't been brilliant at um, meeting those standards. Once we're not in the EU, it's going to be tempting, I think, for a lot of people to say, well, we're not going to meet those standards, so let's just water them down. Or, you know, we need to develop to help the economy, so maybe we don't need these high standards anymore. Um, and then another issue, actually, even if we did keep all of the legislation as it is, at the moment, EU legislation on the environment is underpinned by certain environmental principles that are written into the EU treaties, and these apply across all policy areas. So, for example, there's the principle of sustainable development, the, the precautionary principle, and um, the principle that the polluter should pay. And all of these are not just about environmental legislation. In theory, they should apply to any policy or legislation in the EU. And at the moment, the withdrawal bill does not intend to bring them into UK law. So even if we bring over all the environmental legislation, it's weakened by not being underpinned by those principles. Um, and actually, just you know, what we were talking about before about using sort of stories rather than evidence um, as an example of how we really need to do that within the sort of environment, like the UK-wide environmental NGOs we have sort of coalition working on Brexit. And uh, we were all asked to come up with examples of uh, sort of case studies of these principles in action and, and how they could be lost. And everybody went and wrote very kind of technical, nerdy ones with, with Latin names for species and stuff in. And then we were told, well, the media team say, we need something more sexy to really illustrate this. And it's true, but it's quite hard to do because you know, one of the examples we gave from Northern Ireland was about the precautionary principle in protecting horse muscles in Stranford Lock. I'm not really sure how many people, and it's, it's quite hard to get people to, to care about your puffins and curlews, but to get people to care about the horse muscle is possibly even harder. But also, even so, when I, even if people were like, well, horse muscles are nice, I don't think many people would really think, well, that's going to significantly affect my life. But then, you know, we talked earlier about you still need to keep the evidence base. And it's very hard, and I found this as well, I, I used to work in, in the European Parliament, and it's always very hard when there's an EU myth and it's very, you could be very quick to say, well, this is just what we'd expect from the EU. And then everyone who wants to counter that myth has to go away and check the facts and find out what the truth is. It's a lot harder to give a detailed argument. So, you know, someone said maybe we just need to come up with very simplistic arguments. You could just say, well, if we lose the polluter pays principle, then there's a risk that the consumer will end up paying for pollution or taxpayers will end up paying for pollution. But you'd want to be very careful about using that argument without checking the evidence base first. So it does make it hard for us to come up with kind of real, real life examples for people that affect their life without misleading people, I think. And that's something that is going to be a challenge for us as we kind of go forward. Um, finally, I think the last thing, and this is quite an important issue for us, is at the moment a lot of EU, most EU legislation is overseen by the European Commission and the European Court of Justice. So, and in Northern Ireland, that's been particularly important for making sure that environmental legislation is implemented. There have been a number of cases where implementation was only done because the EU threatened to impose sanctions on the Northern Ireland <coughs> government if they didn't, or in some cases, still not being done properly, but the threat of sanctions <coughs> is there. Um, and once we lose that oversight, within the whole of the UK, there'll be a, a huge governance gap. It's possibly arguably worse in Northern Ireland because we don't have very strong institutions, we don't have an independent environmental protection agency. Um, and the, the UK government has kind of said, well, we don't need it at the moment. Judicial review and parliamentary scrutiny is enough. But those, those two kind of things are not equivalent to the ability for people to take complaints direct to the commission and know that they'll be investigated. They're not the same as having a sort of wider body that can impose sanctions on a government that doesn't implement the law. So it's possible that even if we did bring over all of environmental legislation into UK law and it was all kept as good, if not even better than it is now, that it just won't be enforced because we don't have that sort of governance. And that's what we replace that with. It's going to be a really huge question as we leave the EU. Um, I think also, obviously, in a Northern Ireland context, it's important to say something about the cross-border element. Um, so, obviously, the, the island of Ireland is a single biogeographic unit, so although whatever kind of border we end up with between the two parts, there's, there's environmental issues that are going to cross the border. It doesn't matter you know, what we, what the air quality here will affect the air quality in the south. And we have, I think, three or four, I can't remember, from head, shared water basin districts and so on. And it's been easier for us to cooperate on environmental protection because both countries have been working under the same legislative framework. 
But obviously, even if we keep all the legislation the same, there's a very strong chance that over time that legislation is going to diverge and it will make it harder for us to work together. You know, especially if we lose the requirements from the EU to report everything to the Commission or to share information with other EU countries. We're not necessarily going to be cooperating with the Republic of Ireland in the same way. And that means it's going to be harder to protect the environment. And if it's harder to protect the environment, there's a, a strong possibility that the environment in both the South End and here in the North is going to get worse. Um, and then I think normally when I speak at these events, I can focus on nature and environment protection and have somebody else speaking about agriculture. But I thought it's important to say something about this because it's very important for the environment. Um, and it's maybe one area where there is more of a, I think, more opportunity for change. Um, there's obviously a risk that as we leave the EU, especially with the kind of economic and trade issues, there's going to be a, a temptation and a risk that we'll move to a more intensive model of farming in Northern Ireland, which will not be good for the environment. Um, especially, you know, if we, we have a trade deal with somewhere like China or the US, and we've got very cheap meat coming into Northern Ireland, farmers are going to want to compete with that to reduce cheap meat, cheap meat themselves. However, it's also an opportunity to replace the common agricultural policy, which I think most people would agree is not particularly sustainable or environmentally friendly, and um, move to something that is more sustainable, something that pays farmers for public goods like carbon storage, flood prevention, and protecting biodiversity, and encourages them to farm in a way that's sustainable, that produces high quality food, rather than just kind of intensive, lots of pesticides, lots of, of meat. Um, and that's something that environmental NGOs are certainly pushing for. And surprisingly, it seems to be something that Michael Gove is also pushing for at the moment. And so there is possibly more so than the other areas, an opportunity to seize there to say, well, Michael Gove's saying this. How much you will trust him on that it maybe is a question. But while he's saying these things, and he's been saying them a lot, I think there's definitely an opportunity for us to get something from that and hopefully have a, a better agricultural policy in the future. Um, so that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you.